Amen. I love coming to church. I mean, I live for church. I don't know about you, but I live for church. It is exciting, and I always anticipate God doing something good. And if you don't feel that way, you need to check your heart. Amen. Because God is here, and things are happening at the church of Columbus. Amen. If you would be so kind to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 6, and while you're turning there, I just want to thank the Lord and Pastor Shepherd for the opportunity to stand in his stead tonight. It's a great honor to minister the word of the Lord to the saints of the Church of Columbus. You're just the best. Amen. And uh, if you will turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 1, excuse me, 6, verses 1. We're going to go 1, 2, and 3. And uh, this is what the word of the Lord says. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Shall we bow our heads and pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for visiting us with your presence this evening. And we ask that you would minister to our hearts, minds, and souls. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Amen. And tonight I want to minister to you knowing your God. Knowing your God. Now, we just read in your hearing tonight scriptures relating to Moses going before Pharaoh and uh, demanding that Pharaoh let his people go. And Moses and the people of Israel are now facing their darkest hour as he and Aaron have just returned from their confrontation with Moses, to, with Pharaoh, to let my people go. And although Moses carried himself with divine authority, Pharaoh is unaffected, and instead of releasing Israel, the Bible says that he increased his tyrannical hand upon them, giving them no more straw, which embittered Israel's leaders against Moses. Pharaoh is at the height of his pride, and Israel is in the depth of her misery as things went from bad to worse. And the next thing we know, Moses is at the end of his wits as he returns to the Lord. And God silences his complaints with his assurance of success. And he says this, Exodus 6 and 1, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. So often when we run into trouble, it seems that we rather run away from God than run to God. But Moses, amen, did the right thing. He went to God when he couldn't take any more. When the oppression, amen, of Pharaoh and the anger against him with Israel's leader got to be too much. Uh, he went to God and said, now what do you want me to do? And God immediately silenced him and he says, now thou shalt see what I will do to Pharaoh. God immediately takes the authority. Moses, you are my mouthpiece, but I am God Almighty. I have sent you to speak a word, but I'm the one that does the works. And so often, amen, we are looking at other things and people, but God is the one that shall deliver you. God is the one that's going to redeem you and heal you and set you free and bring it to pass as he said. And he let Moses know. I'm putting you in check, Moses. I need to give you the assurance that we are going to succeed because I am going to do something to Pharaoh. Pharaoh may have told Moses that he would not let Israel go. But God, who is far superior and mightier, would force his hand. And eventually, Pharaoh would weary of the heavy hand of God upon him and his kingdom and her people. And he would indeed drive Israel away, knowing his reactions were only the result of humbling and subjugation at the behest of God. The pressure was so immense that Pharaoh said, get out of Dodge. I can't take it anymore. This hand of God is heavy upon me. Get 
out of Egypt. And God did exactly what he said uh, that he was going to do. Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. Now shalt thou see what God will do for you in your stead. Uh, now you will see how God uh, will fight for you and you will be more than a conqueror. You will be victorious because God will do it. Uh, it doesn't come by other people. It comes by Almighty God. The God that we serve and worship, the God that we pray to, uh, he is faithful to the faithful and when you know your God, you can stand with assurance and a no doubt uh, he is going to do what the word says uh, that he would do. Can we give him a hand clap tonight? <laughs> he wearied of the hand of God upon his kingdom and his people. And he was going to drive them out in a way he wanted to get rid of the problem. But this lets you know tonight that no matter how loud Satan growls and roars against you or the people of God, no one can thwart the will of God nor his anointing because God is for his people tonight. Deuteronomy 31 and 6 says, For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee I don't know what we mumble and grumble about when we have a God that is so faithful to his word and his people our problem is we are looking at our problems instead of the God that we serve we're paying attention to what people say instead of what the word of God declares in his Bible Amen. hallelujah hallelujah God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name of God Almighty. In other words, he was not, he not only was Yahweh, I am the Lord, but he tells Moses that he is God Almighty. He is the El Shaddai, meaning that he is all powerful and does whatever he wants to do. And there is no power greater than our God. There is no power that can thwart him. There's no one that can stand in his way. If God declares it, you can take it to the bank. You can stand on it because he will do what his word says that he will do. Ooh, hallelujah. There's no greater power than God. He is the El Shaddai and Yahweh, the covenantial God performing what he had promised. And by the name of Jehovah, he now performs what he had pledged to the patriarchs and rouses Israel's confidence by perfecting what he began and finishing, amen, what he started. And somewhere in the New Testament, I read in Philippians 1 and 6 that he also is going to perfect that which concerneth me and that which concerneth you what he did back then he is still doing today <laughs> Woo, hallelujah and he continues to this day and we can be confident of this very thing that he which hath begun has God begun a work in you have you been baptized, born of the water and of the spirit? He has begun a, a good work in you and he is going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Don't you dare lay down. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare say that you don't have a God that cares about you. He said he is going to perform what he started in you until the day, amen, of Jesus Christ. Stop being in the mullet grub. Stop saying everything's against you. You have a God that is fighting for you. He is perfecting you. He is transforming you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to know your God. You got to know who he is. You got to know what our God stands for tonight. Let's give him a hand clap. Hallelujah. He is God Almighty who does not change, according to Malachi 3 and 6. He is with you and he comes alongside you just like he did Israel to rescue you from beneath your burdens and your hardships. 
Moses came to the Lord in his blackest hour of despair when God said, I am mighty to save. All your complaints, Moses, all the complaints of Israel, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care how much the Egyptians are heaping on you. I am mighty to save. And I'm going to prove my deity before I leave this place. They're going to know that they had an encounter with the Lord God Almighty. And he is Jehovah. He is the Almighty God. And guess what? That's who we serve. Guess what? That's who we follow. The same God that delivered them is going to deliver you and I tonight. Hallelujah. Woo, give him a hand clap of praise. In your darkest hour, the Lord hears you too when you call and he will respond. God will show himself mighty on your behalf with the same strength and might that he did Israel. He is no respecter of person. If you can believe it and pray it, my God is going to answer it. If you can believe it and stand with him, he's standing with you. He's moved right along upside you and said, all right, do you believe it? Take another step and I'm going to go before you. I'm going to be your rare reward and we're going to do something for the kingdom of God. You're going to be something in the kingdom because you're believing me. You are knowing your God. Whoo, hallelujah. Mm-mm-mm. And if you're feeling overwhelmed by the circumstances that you face and you see no way tonight, according to the book of Daniel, God is the one who determines the course of the world and its events. He removeth kings and he sets them up, according to Daniel 2.21. And if he can do all that, don't you think he can handle your issues? Don't you think he can heal your diseases? Don't you think that he can remove those obstacles that cause you to be sluggish, that cause you to say, I quit, I give up, it's too hard? Hallelujah. No one can challenge what God can do, and none can stay his hand, according to Daniel 4.35. God proved the failure of each Egyptian god as Moses challenged their deities. He began with Osiris, the god of the Nile, and climaxed with the death of the firstborn sons from all unprotected homes, rendering all their gods powerless. A lot of people think, well, you know, the first... First thing that Moses did was throw his staff down and it became a snake. But that wasn't a plague. There were ten things that followed after that. God introduced himself as the God of the miraculous. God introduces you, hallelujah, to you and I by the infilling of the Holy Ghost when that supernatural power falls from heaven like fire and fills us to overflowing capacity that out of our bellies flow that river of living water if we will access and drink it. Hallelujah. Can God deliver you? Oh, yes, he can. God speaks, things happen. His voice is full of power and by it divides the flames. He shakes the wilderness and even causes the hinds to calve, according to Psalms 29, verses 3 through 9. Psalms 33 and 6 states, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He is the supreme ruler of the universe and there is no higher authority than he. There's no one but he. Nothing occurs without his divine permission. He alone commands the forces of nature and uses them to achieve his purpose. We can look in Mark's gospel chapter 4 and we find Jesus awakened by his disciples and asked if he cared if they perished. He addressed the raging storm as a force threatening him and his disciples. But his word of authority silenced the force of the sea. He calmed the maritime not only for the disciples, but for all those little ships that were following behind them. 
See, when God does something, it's not just for you. It's for those in the vicinity of where you're at. It is for those that are around that need to see what you know to be true. The Bible says that there were many little ships out there, but God didn't calm the storm just for the disciples. He saw those that were weary from rowing against the storm. He saw those that were just broken by the winds, and he said, I will declare peace I will speak peace be still and there will be a calm and they will know for an assurance that I am the Lord God Almighty I command the seas and I speak the stars into existence and that's the God that we serve we got to know our God you got to know about your God because if he did it for them he can do it for you Mm. Mm -mm. praise God and if you were to think about it and consider all the combined forces of the earth's storms the sea swells and the other details of nature we could not even that could not even equal in comparison to his almighty power it doesn't matter if there's a hurricane here tornadoes there nothing compares to the power of almighty God you have the same authority and power to stand up and say peace be still in the midst of your storm you don't have to call somebody on the phone you got the same holy ghost and power that he gave the disciples way back then we need to use it and you will use it when you know your God God, hallelujah, God controls nature for his purpose, according to Job 37, verses 2 through 13. In Noah's day, he commanded the fountains of the great deep to be broken up and for the windows of heaven to be opened for 40 days and 40 nights. He directs our paths. He's charted them before the beginning of time and retains every ability to be in absolute control. You might deviate from the path, but God's got a course for you. He directs us. He knows everything about us, and nothing is hidden from his all-seeing eye because God is a searcher. God is a searcher. Psalms 139, verses 1 through 6, and he searches all hearts. Psalms 44, 21, and he looks in those secret places. Jeremiah 23 and 24, he's looking for where you might have hid yourself away from his presence. He is searching. What's your real motive? Why are you acting the way that you are? I'm searching. I'm a God that searches. My oh, my eyes go to and fro the altar. I am searching. I am looking. I'm looking for the lost. I'm looking for the saved. I I'm looking to be a blessing and a light to those that will call on my name. He appeared to Abraham and said, I am the almighty God. And then he tells him what he expects of him. He said, walk before me and be thou perfect. God wants us to get it together. Oh, it's not a name only. Oh, I'm a believer. Oh, yes, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe that he died for my sins and I'm going to see him one day when the clouds, amen, are parted and the dead in Christ shall rise and I'm going to rise to meet them in the air and we are going to forever, so ever be with the Lord. He's not just some kind of casual relationship. He is my everything, my all in all. I want to know him in his power and authority. I want more of him. How about you? In biblical times, a person's name said something about their character and their destiny. And throughout God's word, his name shows us the many facets of his divine character and his abilities. For example, Abraham got, called God Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide because he foresees our needs. Now I'm going to pause here for just a second. Uh, two years ago, we filed our income tax. We still haven't got it. And if you've ever tried to call the IRS to find out what's going on, they put you on hold for eternity. They're hoping Jesus comes before they have to answer the phone. I was walking to my car yesterday, and I was coming over here to pray. 
And I said, you know what, Lord? I'm tired of this. Your word says that you are my provider. This is 5 o'clock in the morning. I came over here, and for some reason, I checked my phone. And I said, well, let me check my bank account. Two checks in there from the IRS. God is your provision. See, we take way too much instead of standing on the word of God and declaring what his word says he is. We say, okay, well, I'll call him today. Okay, I'll send another letter. Okay, I'll do that. Declare God as your source and your help. And it's true. I was shocked, but I was up. I was like, oh, yes, Jesus, you did it again. You did it again. And he will do no less for any of you. You've got to know your God and take him at his word. Can we give him a little hand clap? Can we shout a little bit tonight? God is no respecter of person. He just wants somebody that knows him to begin calling on his name. Hallelujah. And I loved it because my husband said, well, you can keep half of that. (laughs) I know that's right. (laughs) But Abraham said of God that he was Jehovah Jireh because he knew that the Lord would provide because God foresees our needs. Abraham at Mount Moriah was commanded by God to sacrifice his son Isaac who stayed his hand just as he got ready to strike his child and how a ram was just where he needed it when he needed it the most. And the Bible says that when an angel called out of heaven and said, don't harm him, they looked behind him and there was the ram caught in the thicket because see God had already made provision for him and all the way up there he said my God will provide a sacrifice now I don't know if he didn't look all around and it didn't matter I know his mind was on his son but sometimes we're so focused on one thing that we forget what is all around us and that God has already made a provision for us and a way out and he did it and he looked behind him and there was the ram and he sacrificed that ram instead of his son therefore he called him Jehovah Jireh Moses called him Jehovah Nissi which means the Lord is my banner from Exodus 17 15 for he is the God who wins our battles and his banner and flag of victory are always going to be lifted high Moses knew his God and experienced his power so when he was standing in the gap as he was raising his hands against the enemy every time he raised them Israel prevailed but when he would tire and he laid his arms down the enemy would prevail but then there was some that came up alongside of him just like the Lord does he comes alongside you and he begins to lift you up and he lifted her lifted his hands up and before you know it they had won the battle because God was Moses banner Psalm 60 and 4 says Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that they may be displayed because of truth. David called and declared him Jehovah Ra'ah, which means the Lord is my shepherd, Psalms 23 and 1. Because God was and is a friend which provides as well as protects the weary soul. And no matter what you might be facing at this very moment, nothing nor ever will be too hard for our God. What do you need? It's not too hard for him to provide. There never was and neither will there ever be any problem or situation too complicated for our God to handle. There's nothing you face that you cannot overcome. Overcome because God is on your side. He is your banner. He is your provision. He is your provider. And when you know your God, you can stand. You can shout in the midst of trouble because you know your God is going to do something about your circumstance. Woo, hallelujah. There is no enemy too strong for God to conquer. None. Neither is there any power, neither is there any prayer too difficult for him to answer. Hallelujah. I remember Doris Simple. There was a a lady in the nursing home, and she was dying. 
and uh, she'd asked me to come. And uh, I did. I thought, oh, my God, what, what do you say, you know? And I looked at her, and I took her hand. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I said, Thou shalt not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And do you know, within days, that woman raised up. She was discharged from the nursing home and went on in God because somebody said, God is going to be my banner today, and I will declare what God declares. I'm going to stand where God says to stand, and I'm going to see the miraculous because I'm standing in faith and I'm doing the will of God. Because when you know you're God, he's going to do it. In God's word, you and I can see where God has intentionally used natural objects and experiences to reveal spiritual things about his nature and the spiritual realm to those that read his word. You know that God is very descriptive about Daniel in the lion's den, about the Shadrach and Meshach being thrown into the fiery furnace. He is very descriptive in how he describes his word and his power. And all through scripture we can find that he has left metaphors that described his personality and his character. He was very creative knowing that examples sometimes teach Better than rules. I'm like this. Show me and I'm going to get it. Give me uh, <laughs> laws or bylaws to read. And it's like, okay, this is just Greek to me. But if you show me, I get it. That's just me. That's how I learn. Some people can look at a book and, oh, my Lord, they just get revelation after revelation. And I'm like, okay, what is it that you're seeing that I'm missing? But God sometimes uses things like metaphors to teach us better than Rules, amen. One of my all-time favorite scriptures to say is Psalms 18, verses 2 and 3. And every time I read this psalm, I get happy. You can look and see how many of your everyday images, your metaphors describe an attribute of almighty God, the God that you serve. And this is how it goes. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, uh, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. You see all the metaphors in there that are talking about what God is? And guess who wrote this psalm? Uh, it was King David who wrote this psalm because he knew above everyone else what it was to be chased, what it was to be courted, uh, what it was to be lifted up out of that trouble and how he was lifted up out of the miry clay. He knew what it was to have pursuers to take his life, but God always delivered him in the nick of time. He knew what it was, and he said, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Do you have enemies today? Well, you certainly have an enemy of the soul. His name is Old Slewfoot. Hallelujah. Listen, this is a metaphorical representation of the Lord's character. And it tells us that he cares and he has capabilities when the Bible says that he is a, a God that is like a rock. Now, it isn't saying that he is a lump of inanimate minerals clumped together by time. But what he is saying is that his nature is solid. It is constant. You can depend on it. It is immovable. And when you fall on it, hey, man, he's not going to crush you, but he's going to succor you and protect you. Daniel 2 and 44 tells us about the rock that would crush the nations in the last day. But the use of this word helps you and me to see the diversity of God's nature. I can't tell you how many times I've read this and like, ooh, yes, Lord. Ooh, yes, Lord. Ooh, yeah, I feel that. God. Ooh, I feel that. Do you ever read the word and it just kind of pricks you? And you say, that's for me? Every time I read this, this is for me. It helps you to see the diversity of God's nature. 
And what Psalms 18 and 2 is telling you is that God is strong. He is unwavering and consistent. He is also your provider and a refuge from the enemy and a stronghold. And he is your shelter and your savior. All in one verse of scripture. And I tell you, if you can't memorize anything, you need to memorize that. Because when you face the hell in life, you're going to stand. You're going to say, I don't care what comes against me. God is my rock. He is my fortress. And he's my tower in which I can run to. And I'm going to be safe. Can we give him a hand clap? In just one verse alone, David, the mighty warrior and servant king, used the sword as well as the pen to illuminate his triumph in God. And by David's written account, we know that David knew his God because he knew what he had been to him. And with brilliant imagery, he describes who God is and what he represented to the king of Israel. And in 2 Samuel 22, verses 2 and 3, he declares, David himself again declares, the Lord God is my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. And so spiritual and encouraging were these psalms that King David gave them to the chief musicians to set to music and use in the temple for songs of worship and praise so that those in attendance would be inspired by what God was and what he did. And what he did for their king, he was going to do for them in their life. What are we stating here tonight, Sister Richards? Well, it's time to start taking God at his word. You know, there was a man in the book of, in the book of Numbers, Balaam, who stated, Hath he said, and shall not he do it? Or hath he spoke, and he shall not make it good? How could David write such a song or Abraham builds such an altar if God had not revealed to each of them who he was. And just like them, if you find yourself in unpredictable circumstances, you can turn to the creator of absolutely everything because there are always things in your life that you have no control over, but he has control over everything. And it's reassuring to know that you and I have a God in heaven who rules over all and in every situation, not just some, not just in a few, but in every situation. Are you telling him about your situation? Are you magnifying him when you pray, God, I know that I'm facing this, but I also know who's going to conquer. I know what I'm going through, but God, you're shaping me in to reflect your glory. Oh, I want to see, hallelujah, the image of Jesus Christ looking back at me when I look into that mirror. I want to see the Lord in my life as we are an example in this community. I want to know my God deeper than I've ever known him. I want to know him to the depths of who he is uh, and the height of all possibilities. I want to know him. He revealed himself so that you and I can go beyond just knowing him to entering into a lifelong commitment accompanied with privilege. My life has been so great since I turned my life over to the Lord. I think of the times that God delivered me with a mighty hand. I think of the times that I was in a strait. Amen. Between two places, I was in trouble. But God would come so unassumingly. And before I know it, I was on the other side of my trouble because I trusted in the El Shaddai, the Jehovah Jireh, the Prince of Peace and the Everlasting Father who said that his word that his peace would increase 
And if you don't have peace, you need to call the one that does. Amen. And in conclusion tonight, I know this is a shorter message, but Scripture reminds each here that Jesus Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh, is the same yesterday, today, and forever, according to Hebrews 13 and 8, and that he is a constant throughout time, according to Hebrews 13 and 8. He will never be strong or weaker. He will never be stronger or weaker. God is God. He will not compromise or change his principle. They are already set in motion. Now, God's not going to compromise with his word. If he did, he would invalidate his word. But he is going to stand on it. He's not compromising. Sin is sin. It doesn't matter what humanity says. If it was sin back then, it is sin today. And we don't compromise with it. Life and his worries may shake you, but your rock of ages can never be moved. God's unchanging word will equip you and me with the ageless truths and his miracle working power as we connect in faith and know this book. Isaiah declared, the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever, Isaiah 40 and 8. Because his words and commands are timeless. He's not going to compromise them. Uh, they've already been established. I am the Lord, I change not. You're going to have to change to come up to what I think. I'm not changing to come to your standards. God will do the miraculous even when each understands the potential you have in God and his demonstrating power. And when we begin to know our God, we're going to magnify his victories here in the earth. We're going to tell it everywhere we go. We're going to give a testimony to the goodness of the Lord and how he brought us from a mighty long way. You don't have to be a biblical scholar to win somebody to the Lord. You've just got to tell them what you've experienced with your walk with God. You've got to tell them how you are an overcomer, how you laid down the things of this world and those against the flesh and the nature of God and you decided that you were going to be changed and transformed and that's exactly what the Lord did. And that's what they're going to listen to. But you've got to know your God. Because the Bible tells us in Daniel 11.32, But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. If you don't know who he is, if coming to church is nothing more than being here on Sunday, you are missing out. If the word of God is never picked up in your home, except on Sunday to read a scripture here and there, you are missing the opportunity to be more than a conqueror. He wants you to use this word and apply it to your heart. He wants you to minister this word to the hurt and the lonely. He wants you to lift him up by the word of God and by the power of his presence. But you've got to know your God to be able to talk about your God. You've got to tell it you got to tell it you got to tell it but the people that do know their God that know their God shall be strong and do exploits can we stand tonight can we give the Lord some worship as we raise our hands and begin to touch his presence tonight God I want to know you I want to know you in your power, in your glory, more than I ever have. God, we're living in tumultuous times, and we know that you're on the brink of coming again, God. Help us, Lord God, to be doing, Lord God, uh, when the trumpet sounds. Help us to be doing, Lord God, when you part that eastern sky, Lord God, to gather the dead in Christ. And they that are left, God. Oh, help us, Lord, to know you. Help us to know you, Lord God, that we would be strong and do exploits. I don't want to keep this to myself. Oh, the field is ready. It's ripe, all ready for harvest. But where are the laborers? Oh, God, let me be a laborer, Lord Jesus. I want to know my God. 
God bless you tonight. Thank you for being at the Church of Columbus.